Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Just trying extra hard today. Uh, looks like we'll have some nice weather for a few more days. Uh, so that's uh, great as well. A lot of announcements I need to share. I'll try to get through them as best I can for a, a worship service where the order of service isn't as complicated. We've got a lot of just communication moving parts we need to share today to keep us together. Some of it uh, a little challenging, a lot of it good. First of all, uh, Kathy Hall, who is our lay leader, our elected lay leader, is scheduled to be liturgist for the month of November, but Kathy gave me a call the other night. Uh, her daughter, Rob and Kathy's daughter, Carmen Wilds, has tested positive for the coronavirus. So we're concerned about Carmen and her family, and Kathy has, um, out of respect for everyone, chosen to be in a self-quarantine situation, she and Rob are, and we appreciate them being conscientious, and they'll be tested soon as well. Kathy asked Liz if Liz would step into the liturgist role uh, this Sunday at least. So uh, we'll pray for Carmen and her family uh, during a time of prayer, but wanted to let you know that. Um, on, on the topic of coronavirus, uh, I need to say, I, I had chosen to say this, and then a, a couple of church leaders uh, tapped my ear this morning as well. Bishop David Bard has sent another letter about his concerns related to the coronavirus pandemic, and this is my interpretation. The bishop has not said in a sort of blanket, uh, all one-size-fits-all way, where he is on this, but I can tell he's getting increasingly concerned again about the way the disease is on the rise again, and it is. And uh, the bishop has made um, a statement in this last communication, my paraphrase, basically some of you from the bishop should consider whether going forward at this time in-person worship may need to be um, postponed again. So he said in a very diplomatic way that he wants all of the churches to evaluate whether it's time to pause and not hold Sunday morning services in the building. We haven't made any decisions yet. We need to look at the local numbers in Cass County and, and consider things. But I want to let you know this, this is where the conversation is right now. Um, and my own conviction that it is real, it's serious. Uh, I am not um, sympathetic to uh, claims that it's exaggerated. I think it's real, um, and, and that's where I am. So we'll be talking seriously about ways we need to keep folks safe. Just be aware. Um, this week, I am needing to be with that Board of Ordained Ministry the West, Mich West Michigan, the Michigan Conference, United Methodist Church, that's the group of about 40 pastors who interview people who are wanting to be uh, received as pastors. And we do all of that via Zoom these days. So you sit, you know, as some of you have done in other meetings, we sit in front of a little camera in front of the computer and uh, there are little pictures of 40 of us on two or three screens and we try to talk together. And uh, this was something the bishop asked me to do, and I need to uh, contribute, and that would be from 1 p.m. on Monday um, until later on Wednesday, probably. Now, we'll get started on Tuesday at 9 a.m. and may go to 9 p.m., and we may do something like that on Wednesday, and I, I, I've been, always been honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you right now. It ain't my favorite thing to do. <laughs> I want to do my part to, to support United Methodist Ministry. I, I understand the bishop's request. I'll honor that. Um, it's hard for me to sit down at a desk for 12 hours. Um, 
especially when I could be up and about dropping something off at somebody's porch and house and praying with somebody. That's just more my style. So I'll, I'll hush up. I'm not, I'll quit whining and do what I got to do for the cause. But just so you know, I'll be a little bit uh, preoccupied from Monday afternoon until Wednesday afternoon. So uh, the, the flowers today are given by Roberta Woodruff in memory of her mother Juanita's birthday. And I think um, a mom's birthday is tomorrow, right, Juanita? The ninth. So we pre appreciate that and the spirit of the gift. Uh, the charge conference, the annual congregational meeting, was held last Thursday night on Zoom, which is, again, that computer platform. And uh, we had a good meeting. If once we got over a few technical bugs and computer glitches here and there, we had a good meeting. Reverend Dwayne Bagley from the district office, our superintendent is his title. He guided us through the, a few votes and decision making. And uh, it was a very collegial, warm, open kind of thing. And um, I'm not sure he's having them quite as open, collegial, and warm <laughs> this fall with other congregations. Uh, and so I think uh, we, were, we were just a good-hearted group for him to work with, and, and, and it felt good. So we, we handed out those packets last week. We may have some more, though I didn't ask Becky, and so I don't want to... Okay, we do. She's given me the thumbs up. If you didn't get one of those packets of some reports and things last Sunday, that's what we used in our meeting Thursday night, and, and we have some more available after service today. Now, um, make sure I'm moving to some events this week. Some things have kind of moved and shifted a little. The bulletin has some of this. Tuesday, 2 p.m., Eagleswood is the... Uh, uh, apartments uh, slash, I'll say assisted living, it may not quite be that, I want to be respectful, but at 2 p.m. there's a small fellowship group that meets out at Eagleswood uh, for some conversation and prayer. Kathy Hall and I usually lead it, and Kathy is staying away for a while. I will be in my meetings, and uh, Karen Benedicts has agreed to step up and be there. I imagine a Shirley Leyland will probably be there, but I, I hate to put Shirley on the spot when I haven't talked to her since Kathy's situation. So Karen, at least, anyone else who wants to come will wear masks and be separate in the room there. Appreciate it. Tuesday night, the worship team will meet at 7 p.m. We'll be in the church basement, spread out with masks to start working on Advent themes and worship material. And then uh, note Thursday, 6 p.m., the Finance Committee is meeting, correct? I got that all right? Just double-checking some of our meetings for this week. Action Ministry. I mentioned that not quite a week and a half ago on a Thursday, a, a Feeding America truck was in a local church parking lot, and we fed 101 families and over 300 people. There was another truck uh, last Thursday at the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and uh, Karen, I think we said about 100 families? Okay, and, and probably over 300 people again, so folks are in need, and uh, a lot of folks are hustling to help those who are in need. I appreciate those of you who are able to help. Now, I'm going off my head here, but I believe not the next truck in our area, maybe, but on the 23rd of November, there will be one at the fire department, correct? I'm not trying to cut another truck out, but I know that one uh, Bob Smith, the fire department, some other folks are helping to coordinate. 23rd Thursday, about 3.30 in the afternoon. We're going to need some help. Okay. Okay. On the 23rd Thursday. So that's right. Or excuse me, I didn't say that. Yeah, I'm about ready to put it on Thanksgiving, aren't I? Oh, goodness. Sorry. No. Yeah, I'm on a Thursday 
roll here, but it's on a Monday? Yeah, thanks. I'm sorry about that. Uh, important ministry. Now, along the lines of important ministry, uh, Sharon Harnden reminded me, and happy to push this along, you know, this is the year or the season when the Feed the Hungry program in town gets rolling. And uh, I, as I understand, Sharon and Becky and some others can correct me here, officially started on Friday the 6th, but I know on Thursday there was a sort of uh, a parade of, to a couple of businesses in town to share some gifts of checks and funds. This is the program that is run by the ever, ever vescent Jim Allen and friends, the, one of the go gettingest charitable get it done to help folks guys around. And uh, I'm told that you may drop off donations to either the First Source Bank, Dwajak Credit Union, or Honor Credit Union, and we're talking checks or some, some funds. Uh, checks can be payable to feed the hungry, that this all stays in the local community, right? Okay. And this year's goal is $20,000. So let's go get it. Okay. Did I get that right? Where did, Sharon, am I looking past you? Where did, there you are. Okay. So we're proud to be a part of that, too. Becky Peters reminded me that in the uh, worship service today, I gave you a new wrinkle that the prayer is more responsive. It's not all in unison, so watch that when it comes up on the screen in a minute. I don't know if you noticed there was not heat in the building this morning. If it's a little cool, we're having a few furnace problems. We're on it. Um, we've, got, we've had good work on the furnace and the field uh, plumbing people are being very helpful, but we just have another glitch in the system, and Frank Butts was able to override something and get us some heat here a little late going, so don't fear, and it feels okay to me, but I move a lot, so um. why don't we share the wave uh, peace of Christ with each other, and make sure we share with the folks who are joining us from home or other ways on the pad, uh, notepads or tablets or computers. Glad everybody is with us. And then I'll turn it over to Liz. The worship. We gather in the name of the living Christ to worship God. and calls us to worship in spirit and in truth. God's love is for you and for all people everywhere, that we may share God's love and life. May we be renewed in the refreshing spirit of the living Christ. The living Christ is with us. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Please be seated for the opening hymn.
Please join me in the prayer of confession. Dear God, you have said in your word that you are the bread of life sent down from heaven. Forgive the quarreling and spiteful ways we abuse your gift of life to us. You said in your word that you alone are eternal life to those who believe. Forgive our unbelief and unfaithful actions. You said in your word that you alone give us life. Forgive our searching for life in dead and lonely places. You said in your word that if we abide you, you would abide in us. Forgive us like we, like lost sheep, have sought comfort in far away places. You said in your word that you gave your life so that the world may have life. Forgive us when we have failed to tell that good news to those around us and to one another. Bread of heaven, come down again, feed us, and rest in our hearts. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Psalm, chapter 78, verses 1 through 7. Give ear, O people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a decree in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and rise up and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Our second reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 15. You shall not steal. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel lesson today is from the book of Luke, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possession, lords, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of God came to seek out and to save the lost. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. Let's pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts assembled here be acceptable unto you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Some of my research and work on writing in the Underground Railroad tradition, the anti-slavery work that I do, has drawn me to the life of Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth, you know, is a 
just a remarkable person in American history. She was born in upstate New York. She was not born in the American South. She was actually born up the Hudson River Valley into a Dutch community, and there was slavery in New York State at that time. And she was born in 1797, so in the early part of the 19th century, she was an enslaved person and had to deal with all of those horrible abusive dynamics of being in that situation. Now in New York State, Unlike the southern United States, laws were passed in the early 1800s outlawing slavery. So the sort of, quote, northern slavery that gets less attention in our history was phased out well before the Civil War. That's one reason it doesn't get the attention. But this was a part of Sojourner Truth's life, and her name at the time was Isabella. And Isabella was a freed person in 1827, one year before the official law took effect. And she was free because, in essence, she walked away. She walked away because some things had been promised her about her freedom, and the person who pretended to own her and claimed all of that didn't follow through. She walked away, and the community surrounded her and, and offered her a safe place. And by the time she had herself situated, she had been freed by the law in any regard. And so Isabella spent the rest of her life traveling, working on behalf of people against slavery. And she ended up, as many of you may know, in Battle Creek, Michigan and died in Battle Creek in the 1880s. There's a wonderful monument or sculpture in honor of Sojourner Truth in downtown Battle Creek. In doing some of the research, I came across a part of her autobiography. It was a narrative where she told her story to a woman named Olive Gilbert, and Ms. Gilbert wrote all this down. At the very end, at the very, very end, Sojourner Truth talks about meeting uh, the man who claimed to be her master late in life. Meeting this fellow after all of those years. And Olive Gilbert wrote this. She, Sojourner, recalled the lectures he, Mr. Dumont, used to give his workers on speaking the truth and being honest and laughing, Sojourner says, he taught us not to lie and steal when he was stealing all the time himself and did not know it, end quote. If you study these documents from the period, you'll see that many of the people who called themselves masters or mistresses would often use Sunday school lessons and things to teach enslaved people to be honest, to never to steal, to be on time, all of these things that are overall good character traits, but they were taught as ways to keep people in line. And all the while, these same people were stealing all the time. What were they stealing? Well, it's not so much what, but who or whom were they stealing? Human beings. One of the greatest charges leveled against people who claim to be slave owners is that they were, quote, man-stealers, end quote. Man-stealers. People who didn't know the difference between the value of a person and the value of a thing. And so all the time they're telling people under their abusive control, don't steal, don't lie, don't do that. But they themselves were stealing people, human beings. This raises a lot of questions. Because today we're confronted with the Eighth Commandment that is very, very short and very, very blunt. It's another one of those like the commandment not to murder, not to commit adultery, that is 
barely a few words. If you did not listen carefully when Liz was reading scripture, you might have missed it. Because we had a rather long reading from the psalm, and then this very short commandment against stealing in Exodus. And then a long story about Zacchaeus and Jesus in Luke 19. It's a very short commandment. It's one of those that, that is a two-word, actually, like murder, not, or not murder. Commit adultery, not, or not commit adultery. This is a two-word commandment where there is a not word, and then the word that is described, the thing that you shouldn't do, stealing. Very, very short. What does it mean? Well, you look into the Hebrew language and you see that this word stealing implies a kind of sneakiness. Well, you know, and you can imagine that oftentimes stealing is done in that context. You know, kind of stealthy, sneaking around. Underhanded. Devious, right? So what does it mean to steal in the biblical sense? How do we address that issue? It's obvious from the commandment that stealing is considered to be bad. There's no way to get around that. And I have no interest in suggesting we soft play the commandment. But what is meant by stealing? Sojourner Truth understood, and in fact, in other parts of her narrative, she said that she never took food or bread or that didn't belong to her because that would just you know, violate her own principles. So while some people may have justified that, she didn't. And yet at the same time, she knew that the people who claimed to own her, claimed to own her, were stealing all the time. Taking what didn't belong to them. And then preaching Sunday school lessons to keep the folks in line. So what is stealing? Let's look at the story of Zacchaeus. When in doubt, go to Jesus, right? And just as the life and ministry of Jesus sheds light on all the other commandments, his life and ministry also sheds light on the eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal or don't steal. We talked about life and death. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus took that commandment about murder and he lifted it up to a higher plane. He didn't soft pedal it. He didn't say, well, it doesn't really mean that. In some ways, he made it harder. Hey, if you murder in your heart, mm -mm. same thing with adultery, right? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus took that commandment and he raised it up to a higher plane. You know, you've heard this, okay, but when you lust after another person and when you do this, mm, mm, mm. It's similar in the story of Zacchaeus. Jesus does not deny that theft is wrong, but he puts this whole question on a higher plane that might confront all of us in new ways. The story of Zacchaeus, you know, the guy who climbs the sycamore tree? It's a story of theft and redemption. That's what it is. It's a story of theft and redemption. So let me offer three things about the story of Zacchaeus. Not the only three things that can be offered about it, but at least three things. First of all, stealing is more than a problem of, quote, little people taking something that doesn't belong to them. It's more than that. It's more than that. In the story of Zacchaeus, you have a man who was Jewish among his own Jewish community doing the work for the Roman invaders. Do you get that dynamic? He was among his own people, if you will, his own community doing the work of a foreign power and oppressor, the Romans. When the Romans took over this region, as they did in so many places, they extracted taxes, right? 
Conquering armies and political operations often do that. One of the reasons the colonists and the Americas were so upset about taxation without representation is because the British government was trying to raise funds to pay for the Seven Years' War, what we called the French and Indian War, right? Governments in trouble, or governments that are powerful, try to find the revenue from someone else. And so the Roman government was, in essence, stealing from the people in Palestine, and the Holy Land, and Zacchaeus was one of their agents to extract this money. And the way it worked is somewhat clouded. The scholars aren't quite sure how this worked, but there was almost a franchise situation <laughs> involved here where the Roman authorities would find a Jewish person who would take on the job of collecting the taxes. And I found different judgments or discernment among the Bible scholars about how this worked exactly. Some have claimed that the person who has appointed the agent, the tax collector, would front the tax to the Romans. In essence, give them or find some source of funding to send on to Rome, and then they were given a kind of license to go around and recoup it all by collecting from other folks. You see how corruption creeps into this? <laughs> You know, if in, in our terminology, one that collects a million dollars or needs to front a million dollars, do you see how in the end of the collection racket, that same person who fronted the money could end up with 1.5 million in his or her own pocket? This was the kind of dynamic at play. No wonder tax collectors were hated, really. Not only because they were collecting taxes from a foreign power, the Roman government, but because of the way they did it and the exploitation. It's like a racketeering, a criminal enterprise. They have the appointed, quote, franchise, if you will. And as long as the Romans get what the Romans say they want, which is, in essence, stealing from the Palestinians, then who cares what the rogue agent does? And if the rogue agent ends up with a house bigger than everyone else and a couple extra chariots, my wild paraphrase, so be it, right? This was Zacchaeus. He was a slimy, sleazy, dirtbag character, to put it in street language. This was Zacchaeus, okay? And as the story unfolds, Zacchaeus knows it. You know, he could hardly miss the fact that people didn't like him. He was not invited anywhere, he was shunned. But you know, you'd make your decision. I don't care if they like me. I got all the power and the money in this town, right? All those dynamics. But he was shunned. And when Jesus came down the road, he did a ridiculous thing. He climbed up in a tree to see this guy, Jesus, because something was broken in his life, and he knew this person, Jesus, had the answer. You see? And when Jesus comes along, in fact, I may be putting Liz on the spot, but I love how she read this. When Jesus comes along, and Zacchaeus is in the tree, Jesus basically looks up and says, Hey, Zacchaeus, hurry down. I'm going to come to your house today. I'm going to come to your house today. And what does Zacchaeus do? He scurries down. The people are mad at Jesus because he's going to this crooked son of a gun's place. And Zacchaeus says, Lord, I'm going to give back anything I stole from the folks times four. You know, times four. And every indication is he meant it and he did it. You see, this story about Zacchaeus is more 
than a story about little people or powerless people stealing little things from others. I remember one of the times I was so severely taken aback. I was in a, a formal luncheon with some leaders of the community in another town, and it was during the Great Recession or the Economic Recession 2009-10, and sitting there was a community, quote, leader who basically got up after lunch and said to the gathered group, this is a very hard time for businesses. And, and he was right, it was. And when we acknowledged that fact, he went on to say, you know, I talked to the CEO of a corporation and he said he was having a terrible time because in this economic downturn, you had three kinds of people. You had the leaders at the top, you had the middle management, and then you had the people on the, on the floor of the stores, the folks at the cash registers. And sadly, when you need to lay off people, you often lay off middle management. Can't afford that. And so you have nobody to keep an eye on the little people at the cash registers. And the message was really clear from this fellow. In an economic downturn, you don't have enough strong people to keep an eye on those crooked little people who might steal nickel and dime here and there. I was aghast. I was aghast. Stealing is a problem wherever people are in the chain of authority. And sometimes it's an especially big problem with those at the top. Zacchaeus was one of those people at the top in his community. Secondly, though, Jesus, this is important, wishes restoration, not simply punishment for those who steal. Do you get that? Zacchaeus is a story about theft and redemption. I learned this dynamic in the Zacchaeus story as I was a pastor of a, a really a pretty vibrant church as it came along and grew and people joined, a lot of young families. We had a Bible school uh, ministry in the summertime that was a blast. Maybe you've been in and out of those places in former years. We uh, had Bible school with about 130 youngsters and, you know, my playful nature was such that I loved to go in the sanctuary with them and sing and all of that jazz. And we had somebody with a lot of pep on a piano and we would bring in the drum kit and, you know, somebody's playing drums of the kids' songs and, you know, boys and girls for Jesus. It was fun. Inevitably, you'd sing the Zacchaeus song. Do you know the Zacchaeus song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for his Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree. The kids, all 130 of them are there. And then when Jesus is ready to issue the invitation, Zacchaeus, come down, I'm going to your house today. Inevitably, nobody taught them this. Just instinctively, 130 kids went, Zacchaeus, you come down. For I'm going to your house today. For... Now, I imagine a lot of those kids received that kind of uh, confrontation if they tried to climb a tree, right? Can you imagine that? You come down. And nobody told them to sing it that way. It was just an instinct. And they would always shake their fingers. You talk about the subliminal, the unstated message in a lot of Christian education, right? Who is Zacchaeus? Boy, he's a guy Jesus yelled at because he climbed a tree. No. Jesus said, come down, I'm going to go to your house today. See? See? Jesus sought redemption, not this, okay? For powerful people or not powerful people, I take it, around the issue of theft. 
It's all wrong, but Jesus seeks redemption, okay? Jesus seeks redemption. And ultimately, thirdly, for the redemption to be real, it does need to issue in some form of reparation, of making whole, of doing the best to make it right. Zacchaeus said he gave back, or he would. There's some dispute as to whether he was already starting that when he went up the tree or not. You, you get the language scholars arguing with, does he, did Zacchaeus say, hey, Lord, I'm already giving back four times of what I stole, or I will give back, and so, you know, the scholars go back and forth on this. We're not sure. But we have every reason to believe he did it in the end. Four times what he stole. That doesn't mean he just gives back the stuff he took that he should not have taken. He had to find a way, honorably, we hope, to give back four times that. And you know what a rigorous commitment that would be then to track down everybody you wronged to try to make it right? That's a hard thing, but he tried. And he must have done a significant amount of that. If you look at the scriptures, in the Old Testament anyway, you find all these varied formulas for what happens when somebody steals and how they can try to make it right. And uh, some people say, well, it was, you know, it was a matter of giving back everything stolen plus a modest percentage as a kind of uh, confession and, and a, a sense that you're sorry. And... Others thought, no, it's, it's more than just everything you stole in a small percentage. It could be twice, three times. In any regard, Zacchaeus goes beyond the law for the good, right? Four times. Four times, see? So stealing is not just a matter of little people taking stuff however you use the term little people. It's a matter we all have to confront. Stealing, though, is meant by Jesus, honestly, but out of an intent for redemption. And finally, if the redemption is real, the person making amends must follow through. I'll close with this story. It's a story about... Uh, a football coach. Well, not really about him, but a, a youngster who is 12 years old and a football coach in Wichita, Kansas. A.J. Bohannon is the coach. He's a fairly young guy himself, probably in his late 20s or, you know, early 30s, football coach in the community. And somehow, Coach Bohannon's car was broken into one night at 3 or 4 in the morning. There was a security camera that caught a shadowy figure. And Coach Bohannon, before the police were called, somehow had access to this camera footage and identified the culprit as a 12-year-old boy. And so Coach Bohannon, instead of calling the police in that moment, he would have had every right to, maybe, maybe in some regards he should have, he chose to go find the boy. He went and found the boy, and as it turns out, $2,000 worth of equipment had been stolen out of Coach Bohannon's car by a 12-year-old kid. And Coach Bohannon confronted him, and after a really heart-wrenching and tear-felt um, dose of reality. The young man confessed, the young boy. He led the coach to all of the equipment that was returned. I don't know that he had the resources to give back four times that. And then the coach did what coaches do so well. Got him to play football. <laughs> Not simply because he wanted to turn this youngster into a star, but he wanted to be in his life and teach him important things. And this is what Coach Bohannon said. 
quote, he robbed the right person. <laughs> because with him doing what he did to me, it gave me an opportunity to really reach out to him and pour some love back into his life. It's unfortunate that we had to meet on those terms, but I think it was a blessing in disguise because now I'll be forever attached to that kid, see? Isn't that a story of theft and redemption? And the thing that impressed me most in Mr. Bohannon's words were these comments. I believe this boy's life is worth far more than anything that was taken. See, he knew what it meant to steal, but he also knew the difference between people and things. And he sought redemption. Redemption. Zacchaeus, come on down. I want to go to your house today. You see? That's what Jesus does with the Eighth Commandment. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to do my best to uh, collect some of our prayer concerns. Certainly want to keep... Um, Kathy Hall and Rob Hall and Carmen Wilds and their family in our prayers as they struggle with uh, at least some of the family members having the coronavirus. Hope that their health uh, will be okay. I need to share that another one of my pastor friends has entered the hospital with the uh, coronavirus. Uh, Reverend Sue Platt is her name. And I don't know how Reverend Platt is doing in recent days, but I was on one of those Zoom meetings with her a week and a half ago, and she said, I don't feel very well. I'm going to get tested. And now she's in the hospital. Um, we need to share that Bob Smith is under the weather today. Um, I want to respect Bob's privacy, but we're concerned about him. He had to go to the hospital for some tests. Uh, as I understand, and is at home, resting okay, but needing to check out a couple of things. So we want to keep Bob in our prayers. Mickey Wilsey is scheduled to have some surgery this week. So we need to keep Mickey in our prayers. We have another uh, member of the congregation, I want to respect some privacy here, who is also going to have some surgery on Wednesday, as Mickey will on Wednesday. Ask for prayers for that person. And uh, Sharon Harnden has shared that her brother, brother-in-law, right? Bob Van Over, who he had triple bypass? Yes. So we want to pray for Bob up in Olympia, Washington. Why am I feeling like I'm... That's why. Tyler Shrout is the young woman we prayed for last week from Michigan State who has a brain tumor, a struggling young lady, and want to keep her in our prayers as well as we continue. And finally, I would like to add as your pastor, prayers for our nation during a time of great division and, and uh, tension and decision-making and um, a sense of, uh, for some people, that uh, things went the way or are going the way they want, others that they went the way or are going the way they don't want, and knowing that as brothers and sisters, we're called to love each other, but let's pray for our nation. Let us pray. Holy God, move among our hearts that we may be agents of redemption for those who need to hear the word of life, for those who need to come in out of the rain. Lord, if we are out in the storm, bring us in under your care and safety. 
For those we've named, Lord, we ask your abiding presence, your healing touch, your power. Give us perspective and principle and determination to do what's right, to love one another and others. And Lord, for our nation, we ask for healing, for thoughtful, caring responses to the division in our land. We ask all of this in the name of the one who taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yes, as they are daily bread. Those are trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time for you what we have been given. The ushers will bring the offering forward during the doxology. Please stand for the doxology. Almighty God, giver of every good and perfect gift, teach us to render to you all that we have and all that we are, that we may praise you not only with our lips, but with our whole lives, turning the duties, the sorrows, and the joys of all our days into a living sacrifice to you. Through our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Please be seated for the closing song. Oh, man. 
man, and the wee little man was he really little. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Hello, and as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm going to your house today. Yes, I'm going to your house today. <laughs> Hey, what's with the Egyptian thing? <laughs> Here we go, one more time. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Very tiny. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. <laughs> there he is. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. If I'm not mistaken, the, you know, those songs used to have the follow the bouncing ball. I think that was a money box. Uh, it would have to look closer, but there you go. We needed that. You know. Go now in the knowledge and love of God, the Father Almighty, in the grace of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, Dwayne. 